<laughs> no, it wasn't. I just said, hey, is this thing on? And it was muted. Jeff, I forgot. <laughs> I was about to say it's like riding a bike being here, but then again, uh, I used to fall off my bike all the time when I was a kid. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Welcome back. It's been a few weeks, and uh, it's great to be back here live with everybody on Logic Live. Hello, Seville and Jeff. I see Michael Landon is here, Karen Baxter, Rafi Skaggs, and Philippe and Carlos. So nice to see your faces again. Oh my goodness, it's Mr. Apollo 222. How are you, my brother? Oh man, it's a beautiful day here in the Hudson Valley of New York. Uh, and uh, if I had to be inside, I would, uh, you know, wait, Jeff, are you serious? Or are you like taking the role of Randy McEntee today and screwing with me that I've created some type of technical problem? <laughs> hey, Rex. Um, if I had to be inside on a beautiful day like today, um, then, you know, I, I wouldn't want to do it with anybody other than you find people. Hello, Toddy. Hello, Mandy. All right, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time for Logic Live. Let's get going. That was for Andy McEntee. Hey, everybody. My name's Andy. Welcome back to Logic Live. We have a great show for you today. We're going to look at some cool stuff, some tips and tricks. And uh, But before we do that, we got to get some business out of the way. So let's push this button here and just get rocking and rolling. This episode of Logic Live is brought to you by Synesis.io, solutions development, integration, and support. Supporting Flame artists since 1997. Thank you, Synesis, and thank you, AJA, together with Flame since 2006. They make the best video hardware in the biz, and so if you uh, need anything, if you need to get your video out of your Flame, you call our friends over at AJA. Thank you, Steve Losey, we love you so much. Anybody out there need tech support, be sure to call Jack Horrocks, jack at flametech.com.au. If you're having trouble with your flame system, whether it's networking or storage, or you want to custom build a flame, or you want to expand what you have, reach out to Jack. He'll take care of you. He's a wonderful guy, and uh, thank you, Jack, for supporting Logic. And if anyone's in the market for some plugins from Boris FX, you can save 15% on any Boris FX product, standalone or subscription, when you use the code LOGIC-15 at checkout. While you're checking things out, check out the Logic merch store. Uh, it's, uh, it's summer, the weather is nice, so be sure to outfit yourself with a Logic hat or shirt, uh, maybe a Logic water bottle. You can get to that at logic.tv and click the merch button. And we want to thank all of our patrons on Patreon. We're up to 128 patrons, and we could not do what we do here at Logic without all of your support. So we want to thank each and every one of you. Uh, if you'd like to be uh, uh, if you'd like to support what we're doing at Logic for as little as five bucks a month, get access to some exclusive content like the after show that we do uh, after after uh, Logic Live, then head on over to log uh, patreon.com slash Logic TV and become a patron today. Um, just want to congratulate again, Brooks Tomlinson. Uh, Randy was able to get a hold of a fully loaded, fully specced out Lenovo ThinkStation P620 and we wanted to do something nice for our patrons and give back a little bit. And so Brooks Tomlinson was the recipient of that machine. We've got um, some more hardware surprises we, uh, coming for in the months ahead. And so uh, it's just a way of saying thank you to, uh, to our patrons. And thank you, of course, to Lenovo for making it possible. Uh, ran into uh, Andy Dill last week, which was very exciting. And uh, he was sporting this rather awesome Render Dome World Champion belt buckle. I had no idea he had this custom made, but <laughs> I saw that and I was like, hey, Dill, um, do you mind if I share that with the community? So, like, congratulations again, Andy Dill. We have to get another Render Dome going and, uh, and see if we can't make something like this. You know, <laughs> if we can't make something like this part of the prize that everybody wins at the end. Let's give you some forum stats. This is for 2022. I've got some updates for you from uh, since three weeks ago, the last time we had a show. We're now up to 1,136 users. That's up 10 from three weeks ago. 766,000 page views. So we're up 95,000 from three weeks ago. And uh, six... 0.8,000 posts, up 600 from three weeks ago, and we're up to 372 users on Discord. That's up 12. So I want to thank everybody for being involved, getting involved, and staying involved, and, uh, and helping to make Logic the amazing community that it is. Well, Randy put a post up yesterday on the forum that tomorrow on Discord, we're going to do a Logic watch party for the, um, the Apple keynote. So that's at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific and 1 p.m. 
uh, Eastern time. So just head on over to the Logic Discord, and uh, and uh, I think we're probably going to be just in the in the open channel. So be sure to check that out. That's a lot of fun. You can get to the Discord by going to Logic.tv or Forum.Logic.tv and clicking the Discord link uh, up at the top there. Join the conversation and keep the fun going. We released three new classes for Logic Academy for 2022. We just want to make sure everybody knows about them. I did one for, for beauty techniques in flame, covered topics like blemish, blemish removal, cleaning up blotches, red eyes, eye bags, color and texture balancing, and all of that under like an umbrella of working as efficiently as possible. Uh, so definitely check that out when you get a chance. And Randy did two. One, all about the machine learning time warp tool that was uh, gifted to the community by Andre Taloshny. So if you had any questions about how to install it on Mac or Linux or uh, what all the different features are, Randy's machine learning time warp video takes care of that. And then he did one for setting up Pybox, which is a way to connect Flame to other applications. Uh, in this case, Randy showed how to connect Flame and Nuke together with Pybox. So you get a node in batch called Pybox and you can feed something into it. It gets processed into Nuke, spit back out in the batch, and it's just, it's like as though Nuke is a plugin uh, for Flame. So definitely check those out. We added those to the Amazing Logic Academy lineup, Connect and Conform in the Image Node by Jeff Kyle, and Randy also did Intro to NDI, and everybody's favorite, it saved all of our lives, 8-Minute Aces. Check those out at uh, logic.tv or on the YouTube channel. They're available for free, but we do want to thank our friends at Autodesk for sponsoring Logic Academy. Speaking of our friends at Autodesk, Grant K has released uh, a, a new... Uh, series, or he's been working on a new series called Flame Fundamentals for people who are new to Flame. He had uh, released the other day a new module all about blurring a moving object. So if you know anybody who's just getting started with Flame, definitely point them to the Flame Learning Channel and, and Grant's Fundamentals course. It's a tremendous amount of content and um, you know we're very thankful for all that he's doing to help try to spread the love of Flame to as many people as possible. Speaking of love of Flame, uh, our friends at Autodesk release Flame 2023.0.1. So if you have 2023, definitely grab that. It, it's, uh, it fixes uh, a bug with the, the new animation channel editor. So you're going to definitely want to make sure that, that you're running the latest and greatest on that one there. And finally, uh, our friend Randy McEntee was going to be on the show with us today, but something came up and he couldn't make it. But I did want to share with you uh, I did a run through with Randy, and whenever you're in a split screen with Randy, he he you know he kind of moves his head towards the middle line. It's almost like my cat like kind of inches his way towards like the treat bowl, you know, where he knows where the treats are. And uh, so there's if if you you know this is what Randy and I joined forces together with Logic. This is basically what you get, which is one combined human being. And um, I don't know, maybe we'll turn this into a shirt or a mug or or something, <laughs> and just make one of them and just send it to Randy. But sorry you couldn't be here, buddy. Uh, we love you, and uh, we will definitely see you on the forums. All right. Let's do it. I've got three guests coming on today. We're going to show off a whole bunch of great stuff, uh, workflows and tips and tricks. So let's get the party started. I'm going to do this button here. and Oh, there we are. And uh, we have, uh, going clockwise, we have, uh, I'm in the upper right-hand corner, coming to us from Tennessee, we have David Kreitz. How are you, David? I'm well. I'm in Kentucky, though. Uh, well, I meant to say near Tennessee. So I coming am. very close to Tennessee, closer than the, uh, the three of us, is David Kreitz. Uh, but now I know why all the mail I've been sending you gets, gets returned to sender. <laughs> uh, rounding the bend in Oslo is Sinan Viral, who was the guest on Logic Live number two and is back today on Logic Live 84. Good to have you back. Oh, look at that, representing... How you doing, man? And then next to him, I have Tim Farrell from New York, New York. How are you, brother? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, I'm doing just fine. There you go. There you go. And what, what's our drink of choice it's this morning? It's a little noisy outside, so I, I, I'm probably going to keep it on mute when I'm not talking. Oh, gotcha. Let's see. That's just proof that he is coming to us live from New York City because uh, it's always noisy outside. City that never sleeps, I hear. So we have uh, a bunch of things to show. Um, we're gonna start with David. David uh, has, um, if, you haven't, if, uh, if you haven't seen any of David's previous appearances uh, on Logic Live, David does some incredible installation uh, projects where, where, and, and, uh, and does all of the, the content all in flame, the editing, the effects. So uh, David has, is gonna show off uh, some of the stuff from his latest work. You want to take us through that, David? Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Andy. 
course. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, this is some stuff we're doing for the uh, Eternal Gandhi Museum. And uh, this, my suite, um, in the front of my workstation, I've got a window that goes out into um, this space we use for prototyping and uh, projection testing and that kind of stuff. And as you can see, we've got this, it's about a 17 foot tall uh, piece of fabric that's being hung in a semicircle that we're projecting on. And there's gonna be three of these stations in the museum. Um, they tell the different, um, from different times in Gandhi's life, there's gonna be a life cast figure uh, at the bottom um, of each of these, one when he's a boy, one when he's a young man of about 28 is a barrister in, in uh, South Africa. And then uh, when he's an older man, <clears throat> and each of these, uh, we've got the prototype here. We just cut this out, uh, a cutout in our, with our CNC machine, but these pedestals will have uh, bas relief things that have icons basically that will relate to each of the stories. And you come up and touch one of these and it will then make the projection uh, go, um, you know, then tell the story that's connected to it. Um, when we were first working on this, because of this aspect ratio of it, we wanted, we thought we'd probably take a projector and turn it on its side um, because we're working like a nine by 16 kind of uh, ratio because that would give us the best um, resolution to work with and all. But unfortunately, <clears throat> as we got to the venue, everything we uh, saw at the HVAC was going to be a problem. And so the projector had to be hung very, very close to this. And we're having to use an ultra, sh ultra short throw lens. Um, and this creates a couple of um, conditions for us. We're still now with a horizontal projection, as you can see, we get a tremendous amount of, you know, over projection. We're really only using a slice out of the center. And uh, also then there's a tremendous amount of vertical distortion in the, in the image from the lens, from that short throw lens. And we're trying to get everything back uh, into a situation where a visitor here, you know, is going to see it and it's going to appear, you know, pretty, uh, you know, not distorted, not as distorted. So <clears throat> the um, way that uh, did this, um, thought about it and took everything into batch originally. And um, I was going to uh, actually um, map a cylinder. Um, because I thought that would then take care of some of the, it would reverse some of the distortion on the edges of the image, which it does, but um, still have to deal with the um, vertical distortion that's happening from the lens. <clears throat> so after playing with it for a while, I actually ended up not using the uh, uh, cylinder approach at all. I basically took a pretty straightforward approach. And as I was saying before, since I'm out here live and can be actually, I'm hosed into this projector and being able to watch what's going on as I'm doing it. What I did was just turn the uh, surface into an extended by cubic and subdivided it a couple times. And really it was just a matter then of uh, taking these, well, not doing that, <laughs> taking these, uh, <clears throat> the vertices and working them a bit at a time, keeping the top pretty much pinned, but then working things a bit a little bit more and more as, as, as it went right now, you're not gonna obviously see the, the eventual result of it, but it was ba basically just kind of rocking it in this way and then taking the sides, the next two sides and pulling those up, not quite as much. And, you know, just kind of warping it, <clears throat> keeping it all straight. And then these the outside edges need to be taken and be moved down so that we can kind of get a straight edge around the thing it was kind of counterintuitive, but what's what needed to be done to make it work. So it's really kind of a simple approach um, in, the, in the long run with it, but it actually works pretty well. And as I say, being able to watch it as you go, um, you rock it into place and you get something for the, for the uh, visitor that's, you know, going to work pretty well. I'm still not completely happy with the way it's all done. I'm not really finished with it yet, but it's a technique that's going to work to make this happen. Um, it's, it's wild, David. It's like a, um, you know, you're, you're doing like a live UV map, you know, like yeah. you're, un you're, you're doing whatever you have to do to unwrap the image. So it wraps properly, not only on yeah. the surface, but within the restraints or the constraints of the, the projector that you have. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, it's, um, so we've also, there's another um, part of this project that um, we're just now starting to do some tests on stuff, a bit of projection testings for the main theater. Um, and this, there's going to be 
this is one side wing of what's going to be the theater. If you can imagine this and then a mirrored version of this on the other side with a screen in between. Um, this is a piece of fabric here. And then these are actually metal rods that are coated to kind of look like rope. And they're about, they're in an array, a three-dimensional array. And they're about six inches behind this piece of fabric. And this piece of fabric is about six inches behind these. So it's this thing's a little more than a foot in depth. And then there's going to be a center screen of fabric and a couple of layers that'll be there, which again, gives it some depth. As I said, there'll be a mirror of this on the other side uh, that is going to... Um, they'll basically uh, bookend the, the main screen, but we'll be projecting on this as well. Um, so we've just kind of been doing some tests with different uh, storyboards and, and things to see what's happening and see what happens with the projection, you know, how it kind of breaks it up around the edge of things, makes things interesting. It's not going to be so good for text, but you can see here just at a, get some really, uh, like when we get somebody's face or something over on this side, obviously all this stuff that's in the center here is just the edge of our prototype and this is just the wall that's projecting on it. It gives you an idea of why the way this is going to bleed over. So this is kind of the next frontier, the next challenge, which I'm not really sure all what's going to be involved with that, but that's uh, that's going to be, be the next thing. So that's pretty much it. That's wild, man. How And how long have you been working on this? Uh, the sculptures I've been working on, um, well, off and on, I, I just finished the, the musical score for the main theater. And so I'm doing the, the kind of working on these things in town. There's also scores for all nine of the, the uh, sculpture projections. So I've been working on the, uh, there's, we've been so far, we've only done three of the sculpture projections and worked on those for a couple of weeks. And uh, the um, main theater, as I say, is just now getting started. They're, we're just now storyboarding and it'll be going into edit for too long. And I've got the soundtrack done, just got it approved um, actually on Friday. So uh, next thing is going to start working on the, on the visual part of it. So. That's wild, man. I love seeing the projects that you do, David. It's really, really just, it's inspiring that you take on not only like all aspects of the job, you know, including the audio. I forgot about that, that you do all the audio mixing uh, and everything yourself. But uh, it's just it's just wonderful to see flame used in a, in such a unique and creative way. Well, well thanks. It's a it's a great tool, <laughs> you know, and um, it's allowed me to do pretty much everything in in one program for the most part, except for final audio and uh, some three D assets. But I mean, everything else, I it's it's the hub for everything. So yeah, it's great. That's great. I I, I know I've said this, I said it to you when we did the run through, but I would love to come uh, and check out you know your 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 space and your facility live. I'll make sure to come to Kentucky. Uh, when, I, when I do that, um, otherwise I'll just you, there'll be a picture of me just kind of looking around, you know, at the same address. Well, Tennessee's close. It's a border state, so you weren't you weren't right. far. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks so much, man. Thanks for coming on and sharing. Oh, uh, thank you. All right. Next up, we have our friend Sinan Viral. How are you, my friend? Hello. And uh, you have some. Uh, you always have some create some some interesting and creative things to show, but this one is is really kind of. Uh, like graphic design oriented, and uh, well, let's call it procedural, shall we? Yes, and um, the other one is more of a toy. Yes, let's call it procedural. Let's so call I it got, procedural. <laughs> um, two procedural toys for you today. Uh, both of them could use recursive ops. So the first one was actually inspired, well, actually recreation of um, an effect or like an application that uh, people have. Uh, to create like a color uh, stripe of a movie, right? So you can, I've first seen this on the internet uh, on some color sites maybe, I don't know. But you also mentioned on our pre-run that uh, Luster or Smoke had this uh, functionality. So what I have here right. is, let's call this your showreel, your um, latest um, TV commercial or your feature film. Um, so I'm using an impl uh, an implementation of our dear friend Ivar's the what was this one called the famous demo. Yeah. So instead of demo. using yeah instead of using um, a movie or a, a TV commercial, I'm just using this uh, matchbox to generate this movie. It also um, fits to our procedural theme. Yes, it does. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, everything here is like procedural and generative. Um, so I'm using, a, the the end product is going to be an image uh, of 1000 pixels by 200 pixels. So it's going to be like a, a strip of color, right? 
So I'm taking the uh, output of this clip, let's call it that, and time warping it to a thousand frames because at the end I'm going to have like 1000 frames on the horizontal. And um, what I do here is um, with a 2D transform, I scale it down to one pixel, right? So this one is actually one pixel wide of the whole image. And then I take this one pixel image and I translate it all the way to the right in a linear fashion. So if I press play here, we're seeing each and every one pixel uh, of the film that we're feeding in. And to get this into an image, we feed this into a recursive ops. And at the end, we see our color strip of our source video clip. I think it was called time slice, like the feature in smoke or bluster or whatever it was. It would give you yeah. something like this. It must have been luster, but it give you something like this underneath the the, the play bar, so you yeah, can yeah, kind of see in one right? strip like, like the palette. Like your... um, yeah, yeah. Ah, so, so this, cool. is, yeah. Th well, get this um, as an image. Put it on your website. Put it on your business card. Print it out as a poster and send it to your clients. Like your latest film looks like this. And when you're exiting, please remember to go back to the first frame because now we're on the last frame. It needs to uh, process everything. We're done here. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, uh, feeding in a film and you're getting like a color stripe of the whole film here. We could probably play around with this a little bit more and maybe change the color. What do you say? So go if we it. add a, a color correct here, and I would auto key and hue is zero. And at the end, the hue is 360. Of course, it is linear. And if I press play, then the image should like cycle through the hue range. Very cool. Uh, our friend Brian Bailey chimed in uh, that the, the, uh, the feature was called time smear and it was in yes. smoke. So oh, there you go. Cool. That's cool. So Pride Month. There you go. Oh, I'm just glad that button still works. <laughs> okay. So on to the next procedural setup. Cool. Again, I forgot to go to the first frame, so it's probably rehashing everything. Okay. Um, this is this was actually um, inspired by a game. It's called Engare, E N G A R E. It's I think by a by an uh, a Persian game developer. So he's got several games on Steam. Um, I think you should go and check it. So. Um, Let's hide these, the surprise. Um, what I have here is just like this hierarchy. And these are like just small bars that we have rotating around each other, right? So on the um, first frame, they're all set to zero on, the, on their Z rotation. And at the end, I'm setting them to like a multiple of 360 so they complete their whole turns, however, uh, how much ever they might be. And they are in their uh, beginning position at the end of 500 frames. So when you play around, press play, it's just like this thing. And of course, if we feed it into the recursive ops and wait for a while, you get this nice looking geometric pattern. And it should be like uh, a whole, um, you should actually see like the multiples of 360 here. I probably said something to 720, uh, which is uh, like the double. Um, so the actual rotation numbers are like multiples of their Z axis. And when you press play and at the end, it loops back. Uh, so like the, the two or like the trip, 
trick that I did again. I'm turning it down to red now with the color corrector and then hue scaling it or hue shifting it. And if we press play now, it's going to be looking at the result. It's going to be more of a colorful result. You could, of course, change all these um, sizes and placements and angles and well i'm i'm just like winging it now so 360 times let's say four and this one is minus 360 times seven and let's see what that gives us so by uh, changing so these position and rotation values you get vastly different uh, geometric patterns at the end. It is, I think, like called a spirograph or something, mm -hmm. maybe? Yeah, Steve Spike just mentioned that spirograph. Yeah, uh, but why stay there? So here I have, what I have here is, you probably guessed it, a particle system. So I have five lights distributed along the latest, uh, the farthest away um, image. So we could actually maybe try this, but that's later. Okay, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. So this one, um, to, I am going to create them, the lifetime of them are going to be one because particle systems take a lot of time to process, right? So I'm generating five particles in the duration of one frame. But when you set this time steps to five, I hope you can see it. I mean, in the, of course, my screen being ultra wide, it might be small, but the, on the timing tab here, um, on the right hand side, I'm setting the time steps to uh, the number of the particles. So if I set them to five, five particles will be created in the duration of one frame, but they will be evenly distributed. So it's going to be like this. They will be flying away. But I'm keeping the lifetime to one because when we go into recursive ops here, these, come on. Yeah, I'm adding them on top of each other. So you see that I'm creating only five particles per frame, but using the recursive operations, I'm adding them onto each other. So if you don't, if you want to get rid of these um, gaps, we can say generate 25 particles, but the time step should be 25 as well. So when you press play, now we have lines instead of like dots that are moving. So this is going to create continuous lines instead of like dot, dot, dots. Is there Very anything cool. I can do to speed up this processing? Maybe if I set the... This should be faster though. I'm not sure why we're getting so slow here. Uh, we could blame the internet. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we all <But> do. <laughs> always. Um, so back to like less particles. Um, another thing that we could do is again, turn this on and see this more in a colorful fashion. Cool. And after we did our run through with you, uh, I also tried something else. If we um, make the particles stay along for like one second, and I have a turbulence function here and another function that fades the particles off, which I won't be using now. Um, so this should create like, actually I will uh, use these. So at the end of 
the 500 frames, we should see oh, wow. like a nice turbulent pattern. Oh, that's great. Yeah, simple geometric animation, particles, and recursive ops. Awesome. And I think that's all, folks. <laughs> or let it run for a while and see the end result. Right. Let it run. And we'll cut back to it. I, 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 I love that there's some love for recursive ops. I think the last person on the show to show that off was Sean Cochran. And it was, uh, he was making a clean plate or something like that. Yes. Great, great, great feature and, and really doesn't get uh, the love and attention that it, that it deserves. Hold on, let me cut back to your flame and see what we're, oh, wow. That... So you can actually see the turbulence pattern. We could like probably animate this turbulence pattern, but I haven't tried that. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Well, we'll tune in for uh, Logic Live 97 when uh, Sinan will show us the, the turbulence function. <laughs> all worked out we'll have you back to show, we'll have to I, I do would love to have you back on for another particle session okay that was sure. great nicely done okay well thank you Sinan. and if anyone has any questions feel free to drop them in there yeah. you're getting yeah. you're getting uh comments and platitudes and everything uh, but if anyone does have any questions uh about the setups or the settings feel free to fire away brian bailey see great stuff Sinan. yep thanks man all right next up is the Prince of New York, Tim Farrell. How you doing, my How friend? Doing? I'm very well. So what I'm going to show always. you today is, um, you know, way back when I did the tips and shtick, I showed the photo border. And it was a very simple um, expression that I then explained how to make it really, really complicated. And people would wonder, well, why did I spend seven, eight hours working on an effect that I'm probably never going to use again for the next three years? And my explanation was that when I do stuff like that, I learn things. <clears throat> and in that particular case, I discovered that they had recently put the, the lens distort information into the surface. And so by doing that, I got hard numbers for the width and height of the image, which were very difficult to obtain before that. And what I've done with that is I've created an expression that goes into my Z scale so that I can drop every, for every clip on a timeline that's not the resolution of the timeline, I can drop this on it and make it fit just like resize, but then have all the benefits of an action. So well, if that's we an unintended to... consequence, wow. Yeah, so for instance, now we have here a timeline. It's got four different shots. One is UHD, one's nine by 16, one's something from a recent Sony camera um, that was a very odd size, but I'm sure I'll be seeing it again. And another is a mini LF. And so this is actually two different um, uh, effects, one for cropping and one for fitting. And so I'm gonna take this fit and I'm going to drop it on the UHD and it's now fitted into my frame. UHD was only twice the size, easy enough to do. We're going to do the same thing on the nine by 16 and it has given us pillar boxes on the side and it's fit the top and the bottom. I'll take the other one. I'll drop it on. Now it's given me side to side. It fits and I have plenty of room up and down to, to you know, so I, I can work this out fitting it without doing any of the math it's all taken care of for me very cool so and here of course mini lf that's one that we all use all the time and it's fitted to it perfectly now how do we do that let's take a quick look so i've created this i've taken a, a generic um action effect for timeline and i've added an axis between my surface and my default axis and i call that resize rescale actually and in the scaling i have added this expression um Can i don't you know zoom in guys... on that a little bit tim i'm sorry could you zoom in on that a little i could but i don't know if it's going to cut off uh actually it's not doing anything oh there we go wow I mean, if, you, if, if you want i'll hold it here and then i'll <laughs> I'll move it over and you can see the next part. I, it, you know what? It's, 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 I'm going to, I'll, I'll get it from you later. 
And the only difference between these two um, is it's an if-then statement. And the only difference is one of them is a greater than and one is a less than. Now, you'll notice there's, there's a slight drawback with this. It is hardwired to 1920 by 1080. So this is only working for 1920 by 1080 timelines because that's what I deal with the most. Mm -hmm. Now, what's one of the other things we might be able to do with this? Well, oftentimes I get stuff that has been done in Premiere and they've already built some sort of move into it. And so we can see on this with our mini LF stuff that we have this move, but this is not how it's intended to be. This is the move on the full, the full sized picture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into this effect. This is what a premiere effect looks like. It has this global thing and a light yeah, on it. It's a good it. layout. It's also an yeah. efficient use of the space. Yeah, perfectly efficient. But this is the axis that makes the difference. So I'm going to control C this axis. And then I'm just going to reach right up here to my thing and let go. Boom. I've dropped my effect right in there. And I'm going to control V. And I'm going to drop that in between my default axis and my rescale. And now when we go back, we have that same move that the editor did. And it's as if he had done it to the, it's it, as if I had done it to the dailies uh, resolution rather than the, the full resolution. Nice. There's something that I deal with, oh, I don't know, 400 times a day. Exactly. Um, when I'm conforming. That's great. Which is why I, I developed this. Now, as, as we were saying, um, it only worked for the 1080 by 1920, the 1920 by 1080. Um, and you and I had a discussion when we were doing the run through. And I said, I would kind of discovered a few new things. And so this is totally unroad tested. No, but what I discovered is that when you take the one I built for 1920, 1080 and drop it on a 1080, 1920, it changes. You know, I'm pointing at the screen like you can see what I'm doing. <laughs> it changes the near and far, um, and it coincidentally changes the near to the percent, the proportional difference between 1920 and 1080 and 1080 and 1920. So what I did was I went back to that expression, and everywhere it was 1920, I did 1920 times default dot near and 1080 times default dot near. So now we're going to take a look at, we have this vertical timeline and I'm going to do my new test one from up there and I'll drop it on there. And now it has fit my vertical perfectly into my 1920 by 1080, uh, 1080 by 1920. And I have some room to go side to side. We'll go up here to the mini LF one. We'll do the same thing. Boom, we fit it top to bottom. And I have plenty of room to go side to side. So, this is, if anybody wants to try this and, and you know road test it, that's great. I have only used it on one job day before yesterday. Um, it worked great, but I haven't really put it through its paces. So, so there you go. And oh, and, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just a woohoo. That was it. And so, <laughs> in, in in Randy's absence. Uh, we've decided, I've decided to do an extra trick for everybody uh, nice. in, uh, in, in Randy's name. And so this came up on the forum a, a few months ago, maybe a year ago. How do you catch a freeze in a mux? And, you know, a running freeze. And I think somebody wrote back and said, you can't do that. Mux doesn't work that way. That's not true. And this is something that goes back many, many, many years to when we first had action. And the only way you could catch a freeze in action was to go back to your desktop, build a freeze into your clip and load it back in. Except for this, you could do it with the slip. So what we have here is we have a clip and say we want to freeze frame 30. So we'll go up to frame 30 and in our mux timing, we'll put a keyframe. We're going to go back one frame and put another keyframe. Then we're going to go forward one frame and we're going to put a keyframe that says minus one. And we'll take a look at our animation. And we're going to set our extrapolation to linear. So now every time I jog forward, 
my slip, my timing changes proportionally so that now we've frozen on frame 30. So here we are, we're moving right along, we hit frame 30, we freeze. Uh, you'll want to go the other way. We'll go to that first keyframe. We'll set this at one. We'll go to this one. We'll set it at zero. And now we've frozen frame 30 until we get there, and then we release. Super quick, super easy. Love it. And you can do it in anything that has a slip value. You can do it in action. You can do it with a time warp node, anything like that. Nicely done. See, even the, the, the people out on the street were so excited with that, that they're beeping their horns as they go by. Yeah. As, as, as Sinan says, yes, ping pong, loop, and freeze were done like that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And this was before expressions or anything. We used to do it this way. That's great. And I love the fact that you saw the chat on the forums and, you know, we said this could not be done. And you were like, mm -hmm. challenge yeah. accepted. Challenge accepted. Yeah. We're doing this. Yeah, yeah, Game yeah. on. Love it, love it, love it. Well, thanks, man. Thank you so much for sharing all sure. this stuff. And everybody seems, if you look at the chat, everybody seems to love it. Quality of life, right? Things that we do every day. I also love like you, you, those, uh, the, even Brian said he deals, like, uh, he deals with things like this from Premiere all day, every day. So do I. I decided, yeah. of course, that this is just my lot in life. Like this is, <laughs> this yeah. is my burden. But you figured out a way. So thank you so much, Tim. <laughs> You know, and I'm going to tell you, it's not perfect. It, it, it doesn't really like anamorphic stuff very well, but I don't get a lot of that stuff. Um, but, you know, it's a big help. Awesome. Love it. Thank you much. Yep. All right. At my turn here, um, I wanted to share something that I did uh, about a month ago for a, a friend of mine. A friend of mine is a, a real estate photographer and he sent me like a text, like a panic text late at night um, that he had done some shooting in a house and he was doing, sh shooting some video and he must have bumped the focus ring on the lens because when he got back home and checked the shot, uh, the shot was slightly out of focus. And so he asked, is there anything you can do? So I, you know, said, sure, send me, uh, uh, <laughs> Jeff knows this one. He's excited to see it again. <laughs> um, I was like, sure, send me the footage. So let me try sharing my flame here. Can everybody see that? Yes, there we go. Okay, so um, the stuff came in and, and this is what it looked like here. Hold on, there we go. So a simple shot, but let me zoom in so you can really see the, the out of focus detail. And um, Tim, Sinan, and David, uh, I'm, I have no way of seeing like the broadcast while I'm doing this. So uh, if every now and then, if you could go, ooh, <laughs> just give me a little reaction to make sure that um, I haven't accidentally killed the stream, I would appreciate that. Ooh. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, don't have, uh, I don't have Randy McEntee to uh, let me know that I've done something wrong. Um, but So you can see the shot is like slightly out of focus right? Like just out of focus enough, uh, to, to be annoying. Um, mm. and I'll show you the, the other, the other angle too, just so we can see that, um, same room, but then the, the image pans into the, like the dining room. And that's where you can really see, you know, that all this stuff is out of focus. So I, um, the first thing I did is I tried to sharpen it the way that, you know, we usually sharpen things. I tried, uh, like the, the Sapphire, uh, sharpening tool, which is actually amazing. Uh, I think it's called Smart Sharpen, um, and and Flames, you know, um, Sharpen Matchbox node. So I'll show you. This was the original, and then here's what I got, just with regular good old sharpening. And uh, I showed this to my friend, and he was like, "That, yeah, oh yeah." He was like, "That's great," and I was like, "Is it though? Is it? Because when you zoom in." You can see that, you know, all that the sharpening tools really do is they like, they add contrast, they add contrast to edges. So, you know, yes, things might look a little better in here, but you can still see like, here's an out of focus edge on the end of like the, the ottoman here. And none of this stuff really got all its detail brought back. And even though he was happy, I was like, hmm, I think we can, we can do better with this. So challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. That's right. So uh, I, I went and uh, 
I, I, I bounced into uh, Nuke. I'm sure you all remember uh, that back in the day, uh, a few months ago, I did uh, a video on Nuke's copycat tool, um, where you can train your own machine learning tools to um, kind of do whatever you want. You just need a before and an after. And so, um, well, the first thing I did is Nuke has like an AI based like D blur node that they, they, they call it. And so I was like, let me give that a shot. In fact, let me just bring up the original so you can see what Nuke's D blur node did. Oh, hold on. Yada, da, I have the wrong clip. There it is, okay. I still have the wrong clip. One second, hold on. Ooh. Oh, that's it. I just don't have enough frames of it. Um, all right, it's a live demo, everybody. Doing this live. Oh, there we go. Okay. So I was like, let me try Nuke. Nuke has a, a tool. Before I got into Copycat, I was like, they have this tool called D Blur. Let me try that. And, I, you know, at first glance, like, it kind of did something interesting. You know, there's some, some detail brought back where there, there wasn't detail before. You know, some of the bokeh that you see on the edge is, is turned into actual imagery. Like, that, that's kind of cool. There's some telltale signs of, like, machine learning going on, like the the, the uh, quantized uh, or pixelated areas that you see there, or banded rather. But when I went and played the render out of Nuke's D Blur tool, I got something that looked like it, like it was 5,000 degrees in there. There's a lot of, I don't know if you can see it on the stream, but there's a lot of like rippling and warping. Can you all see that? Uh, barely, yes. Um, yeah, it's like Alan Lattery's demos. You've been Thank burned. You. <laughs> uh, You've been burned. I could see it. Even when you were on the still frames going back and forth, I could see things like the doorknob change in shape and stuff. Yeah. yeah it's like there's, a lot, days, there's a lot yeah. of bubbling. It's like it's gone through like a um like a, a, a warp sapphire warp distort or something like that. Um it's just that the you know the machine learning tool here, this AI uh nuke D blur, it's you know, the one of the problems with machine learning is temporal. Uh, yeah. distortions or artifacts. So every frame, it's sampling it as though it had never seen the frame before. And right. each frame is new. And so therefore, each frame is a little different. So maybe that made me think that maybe this D Blur tool in Nuke is more suited for still frames. And that's when I had like my little Eureka moment. There's a, an app out there uh, for Photoshop uh, or for stills called uh, Topaz AI um, sharpen. Topaz Sharpen AI, right? Uh, I, because I, I searched for something in visual effects once, I hear about these guys constantly through all my social media feeds. Um, so, uh, and, and what's his, uh, Rufus, uh, when he was on Logic Live uh, a couple months ago, he, Topaz also makes something called Video Enhanced that'll do upscaling. Yeah. But um, it, it, it didn't do like def uh, refocusing at all. Uh, it just made something bigger. So I went ahead and said, hmm, I wonder if, how this tool works. So I loaded in an image. This is just one frame. I exported a frame from the QuickTime and it pops in. I was like, oh, that's pretty it good. Is. Right? Can you see that uh, on the stream pretty well? Yeah, yeah pretty well. Not really, but... um, well, when you, when you download the 4K stream at home, you're going to be like, oh my God, that results on a still frame. Okay, it's coming up right now. There we go. Boom. So if, I don't know how well you can see on the left and the right side, but it, it gave really good results on a still frame. So that's when I went up. Uh, this is probably a good candidate for copycat. So I took a look at the clip and I found um, like some good keyframes, you know, some candidate frames, four frames that kind of represent everything in the shot. So here and here and here and here or something like that. And the same thing with the other one with the living room, or where you can see the dining room, rather. I just found a bunch of frames, maybe at the beginning, the middle, and the end of this pan, and I ran them through um, that Topaz AI. In fact, you know, I, I do have the before and after from Topaz here. Hold on. There we go. So here's what Topaz AI gave me. This is the before, and I picked the wrong clips. Hold on. It's a live demo, everybody. Uh, here we go, and then after. This will be easier to see. So 
here's the original. Here's what was shot that's out of focus. And that's what Topaz gave me. This is probably easier to see the before and after Ooh. than that split screen. Right? Thank you. Thank yeah. you. It's like you have your own sound effects. Um, again, there's, there's some AI machine learning magic going on in here, you know, but it brought back a tremendous wow. amount of detail, right? Yeah. Crazy. I mean, even if you go into the dining room here before, after. So I took these frames into Nuke and used Copycat um, to train a machine learning model on here's something out of focus and here's the same thing in focus and uh, let it churn for a few hours. And the result that it gave back was amazing, like just brilliant. So, um, and it doesn't have any of the temporal artifacts that, um, that the Nuke uh, AI upscale did. So here's uh, before, after, just coming wow. out of Copycat. And oh, wow. when I play this, there's none of that warping or distorting or anything. So if yes. you have, if, oh, you know what? Let me tab over. No, that would be uncouth if I tabbed over and played a applause sound effect for myself. Um, but we're all thinking it, damn it. So uh, just a good thing to, to note, if you, if you ever have a shot that you're working with in flame that's just like slightly out of focus and anybody who does beauty work has totally had this where you have like, you know, uh, the, the focus is like a close up, there's an extreme close up on the face and the focus is so shallow that like the tip of the nose is in focus, but the eyes are out of focus, stuff like that. If uh, anywhere else in the take, like before or after or heads or tails, there's something you can grab of that face in focus, then you could use that with Copycat to bring the plate back into focus and then have something to work on and be a hero. Um, to your client and your community. We had that uh, this week. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, this man. Problem this week. <laughs> yes, we were a week off. <laughs> oh, sorry. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Um, That's a great solution, Andy. That was oh, thank cool. you. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to just check in the chat here to see. All right, everybody likes it. Okay, good. Sweet. Um, well, that's it. If anybody uh, has any other questions or anything, feel free to, to drop them into the chat. Um, we're going to head over to uh, the, the patrons chat in a few minutes, but um, I just wanted to thank uh, uh, David and Sinan and Tim for coming on today and you know doing a little mini user group here where we're all sharing a little bit of something that, uh, that everybody can enjoy. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, Michael is just saying I should give myself a move. I, I will. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> It's just now I'm, you know what, I need to, uh, I need to re rethink my entire setup here and get a button and, 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 and actually put that to a physical button. <laughs> so that way um, there will never be a problem in, again. But uh, thank you guys very much for coming. If you want to head over to Zoom, uh, we'll see you there in a couple minutes. I'm going to wrap things up here and give away some prizes. And uh, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Let's do this. Wow, I even remained a little centered. Here's uh, where, you know, if you think the machines are taking over, look at what the algorithm uh, has has put here on the uh, the free like wheel of prizes that I get. It's, it's an ad for Ruffles potato chips and a sundress. So, you know, America. All right, everybody, let's uh, spin the wheel. I've got a Logic hat to give away, Logic baseball hat to give away. We're gonna shuffle up the names. And see who our lucky winner is going to be. Andrew Malvasio. Congratulations, brother. All right, coming up next, we'll shuffle again. I got a Logic t-shirt. And your choice of uh, white, black, or gray. Let's spin the wheel. And the... Simon Holden. He's going to be the best dressed man on his block. I can tell you that. And then I've got two licenses of optics to give away from our friends at Boris Effects. So let's shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. And license number one. It's going to Vinod. Congratulations. 
And one more. To Renee! Congratulations, Renee. All right, my friends. Thank you to Boris FX. We appreciate you. And let me go back to full screen for me. And we are gonna go ahead and talk about what's coming up next on Logic Live. Next uh, Sunday, June 12th, uh, at 2 p.m., we're going to have the latest from Mocha and Silhouette from our friends over at Boris Effects. So you definitely want to check that out if you're fans of the two products or curious about them. And then two weeks later, on June 26, we're going to kick off the Summer of Flame. Our friend Frederick Warren from the Flame Dev team is going to come on to take us through some of the new stuff in 2023. Uh, but it'll be an excellent opportunity to talk to Fred uh, and ask him any of your Flame-related questions. If you haven't signed up for the forum yet, please do at forum.logic.tv. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for Discord. And again, remember tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, is the uh, Apple WWDC keynote uh, live stream watch party we're going to have over on Discord. So definitely be a part of that. This episode of Logic Live, like all the previous ones, is uh, going to be on the website at logic.tv shortly. I apologize. I haven't had any new episodes of the podcast yet. Uh, but they are coming soon, I promise you. But if you haven't checked out my interview with Cristobal from, from uh, Runway, definitely check that out. It was a great conversation. Oh, there's Andy Dill. Um, <laughs> uh, please remember to like and subscribe to the Logic YouTube channel if you haven't already. And I want to thank all of our patrons again for, uh, for making Logic possible. If you'd like to become a patron and support what we're doing at Logic, you can do that at patreon.com slash logictv. Be sure to check out the merch store while you're there. And if you're in need of tech support, call Jack Horrocks at jack at flametech.com.au for all your flame tech needs. If you'd like to save 15% on any Boris FX product, standalone or subscription, be sure to use the Logic-15 discount code at checkout. Thank you to AJA and thank you to our friends at Cinesis for supporting Logic Live. And thank you all for being here today. I appreciate you. It's great to be back and we will see you all in a couple, uh, next week. Have a great week, everybody.